behind the camera instead of in front of it and all that kind of good stuff. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll get started. I'm sure more people are going to start to fill in as it's early morning and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, but I'm Kay Chaplin, so you look like you're in the right room because um, everybody here is female. Hi, Brett. <laughs> and Tim. <laughs> That's right. Um, so we're going to talk about why there are so few female directors. And we're going to talk about um, in Hollywood films as well as in independent films. We're going to talk about um, a lot of the numbers, but then also a lot of the solutions as well. So uh, Tim and Joe were so nice to ask me to come and give this talk here at Riverbend. Uh, the first time when I was asked to talk of directing while female, which is now why I call it, was uh, six months ago in Bloomington at IU. And I really hadn't thought at all about the topic. I was kind of too busy directing <laughs> to really think about it. So when they asked me, I'm like, yeah, no pressure, right? You know, explain what it's like for every female director. Psh, no. Um, so I said, give me three months. <laughs> and I started, uh, you know, researching and finding numbers and finding testimonials and things like that um, to really do that. And after I gave that speech, which uh, Brett lovingly filmed, so we got it up on the web and it got some traction, I was asked to come talk at a sci-fi convention, that uh, girls' empowerment meeting, and so on and so on. So. Every time I do this speech, I completely rewrite it. <laughs> I get more testimonials. I get more feedback from the people that attend. And it just uh, grows and grows, and it tries to get more clear and concise and as best as possible, because it's, it's such a big topic. You know what I mean? So I'm going to talk for a bit, and then we're definitely going to open it up for questions, discussion, all that kind of good stuff. Because I want it to be, uh, you know, hey, I have an idea too. Good. <laughs> that will help fix it as well. So I'm really happy because for the first time, I get to give this talk with the brand new 2012 numbers. <laughs> for a while, I was talking about the 2011 numbers, and I always felt bad because I was like a whole year older. So, so let's talk about the data. You guys ready for the numbers? All right, hit me my slide. All right, so the first numbers that we're going to talk about, these are released by the Center for the Study of Women in Film and Television. And what they did is they did a report of the top 250 box office films. Now, there are about 600 films that are released to the box office, OK? Uh, there's thousands more that are released independently, video on demand, direct to video, or film festivals only that don't see that distribution. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the top 250 films. So now, anybody have a guess on what percentage of female directors are in the top 250? Anybody got a guess? 1%. 1%. Shooting really low. <laughs> yes? Uh, I'll guess 3%. 3%. All right, you guys, you're going to be happy then. Hit me in the next slide. It is 9%. <laughs> Woohoo! 9%. Last year it was 5%. So this is the biggest growth that I've actually seen in my lifetime, believe it or not. It is now the exact same as it was in 1998. <laughs> so we really haven't come too far. Um, yes, so we've come up. 4% uh, in our glorious graph. So to give you some better idea of what that is, hit me in the next slide. This is 250 films represented in film reels. And that means out of the 250, 24 in red were directed by women. That kind of sets a little bit of a different <laughs> perspective on it. Hit me in the next slide. This is last year, 12. So this is when I was giving this talk. This is when it all started was, hey, 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 hold on a sec. No! <laughs> hold on. <laughs> I have a power cord. <laughs> OK, so there is an argument that, well, maybe women just don't want to get into directing. They want to stay behind the scenes and producers and editors and things like that. So hit me the next slide. Actually, of the entire lead positions, we're talking directors, writers, executive producers, producers, editors, and cinematographers. Women take up 18% of, again, the top 250 box office reports. Um, this graph will show you throughout the years. It has pretty much stayed at about 18% since 1998 as far as women in the industry and in leading position. So it got me thinking, what other group is kind of a boys club? And I thought of NASA. Hit me the next slide. What percentage do you guys think of women work at NASA? We got 18% in the film industry. Rose, what do you think? Uh, I'll say 25. 25? All right. 11%? 
hit me. 33. 33% of women work for NASA, which psh, I wouldn't have guessed. I saw Apollo 13. <laughs> so that's odd to me. Um, so let's see. Uh, so we've got 9% of women are directors in the Hollywood films. 18% of the entire industry is female. So obviously that's not a what you'd call equal opportunity. Um, so let's talk about this Hollywood problem, okay? These top 250 movies, and let's talk about why there's so few female directors. So hit me with the next slide. When I talk about the Hollywood problem, I'm talking about the big six, okay? The big six are, the big six barely ever changes, by the way. It's kind of been this way for a good long time. They own and operate littler companies. So a lot of times, you know, if you see a film by, let's say, working title, you're like, oh, this is going to be like a nice little indie film. It's actually owned by Universal. So, you know, it's a nice way of them kind of diverging their interests. But they are owned by the big six. So um, I'll give you a lowdown of the logos because some of them are hard to see. Paramount owns Nickelodeon, which also owns MTV. Uh, Warner Brothers owns New Line, HBO, Castle Rock, and the DC film line. Not all of DC, just the film. Sony has Columbia TriStar and Destination. Disney has Pixar, Touchstone, Marvel, just film, Miramax, and I was going to put Lucas on there, but if you guys just saw the reports, they are liquidating, <laughs> liquidating Lucas, so I didn't put Lucas up there. Um, Universal has Comcast and NBC, Focus and Working Title. And 20th Century Fox has Blue Sky, which on top of your Ice Age movies is also your Angry Birds game, and Regency. So these are the big six. So now, the big six only release 25% of the movies, but they dominate, oh, go ahead, you can go ahead for. but they dominate at the box office. This is a random week. This was uh, July of last year, or was it last year? Maybe two years ago. No, last year was has Ted. If you look at the top 10, almost every single one of them, except for one, Lionsgate, is a big six. And you can kind of look at any box office week and to see what the top 10 are. And you're very rarely going to find a non-big six studio in there. But Lionsgate, Medea Witness Program, tell me that Tyler Perry isn't doing something right. I'm just saying. <laughs> um, so a lot of people chime in on how we can fix this Hollywood problem. So go ahead and hit me the next one. The first solution that has been um, put out there is that we need more female-owned production companies. Susan Cartsanis, she, run, she ran Fox for 10 years. And she was the one that first suggested that we needed more female-owned production companies. And in 2011, we did see an increase of female producers and executive producers, but we saw a decline of female directors. Not saying that it's definitely unproven, but when they were on the rise, directors were on the, on the low. So, and producers have stayed pretty much around 20% of the marketplace since 1998, where female directors have stayed between 5 and 9%, right in there. Um, I personally think it's not a solution because it creates a new problem. If you're looking, and you have a female-owned production company, and you're looking to make a film looking for a female director, you're not serving the story. You're actually creating a new problem by hiring somebody by gender, and isn't that kind of what we're trying to stop? <laughs> so I don't think it's the best solution. A uh, second solution that was offered is that we need more female screenwriters. The uh, Feminist Frequency, it's a blog, and also kind of like she does little video bits and stuff like that. She'll, she will tell you that Lego friends <laughs> are terrible for your children. <laughs> but um, she says we need more female screenwriters, and that will attract more female directors in the industry. I can tell you that 95% of female screenwriters break into the industry with a romantic comedy. Uh, they are told, myself included, I wrote spec screenplays for 10 years and submitted them to just about everybody in the big six. <laughs> and uh, a lot of times women, including myself, were told that they're too small. Uh, the, the idea isn't grand enough or big enough. I actually had one script that I sent out as a NASCAR screenplay <laughs> on the exact same query letter, on the exact same script. I had one agent say that it wasn't big enough and another one say it was too expensive. <laughs> 
So they're a little bit kind of bipolar in, in that sort of thing. Um, but for spec screenplays, they are looking for popcorn selling movies uh, because they do know that that other 75% of the films that are released are indies that do the slice of life stories and that do the you know everyday homegrown stories. So Hollywood's looking for the popcorn selling movies, the summer blockbusters, the Hollywood for Oscar consideration, and the spring family animation domination. And then the next solution that's been offered is to prove that female-centered films make money. That's when we'll see more female directors. Well, hit me next slide. Anybody want to guess what the highest grossing film ever directed by a woman is? Dun, dun, dun. No guesses? All right, hit me. Kung Fu Panda 2. <laughs> Kung Fu Panda 2 is your top grossing film of all time worldwide directed by a woman. Did anybody know this was directed by a woman? No. I had no idea. <laughs> I really didn't. Your second, go ahead and hit me, is Mamma Mia. Uh, yes, and Mamma Mia is, oh, is usually a, a guess. Uh, that one hit $609.8 million worldwide. Phil Lloyd, who directed this, um, you can stay on that. Phil Lloyd, who directed this, she went on to do The Iron Lady. So she's actually been doing some awesomeness. So now. Obviously, we've seen that they can make $600 million. So Meryl Streep has actually gotten into this debate, and she's awesome because she will, she will talk at award shows, she will go to women's conferences, and she will talk about why we don't have more female directors. What I think is lovely is she refuses to direct, though. <laughs> She actually is really smart. She was on a 60 Minutes interview, and they're like, why, you know, would you direct, would you direct? Because she wants more women to direct. And she's like, it's like a two-year process from development to the end, when I can just come in and do my part, knock it out of the park, and then go. I have, like, you know, a family and, like, other movies to do. And I'm like, you're smart. Damn it. But instead, she's empowering other women. So this is she's been quoted as saying, five little movies aimed at women have earned $1.6 billion. The Help, Iron Lady, Bridesmaids, Mamma Mia, Devil Wears Prada, and the, uh, sorry, and Devil Wears Prada. The Iron Lady cost $14 million to make, and it brought in $114 million. So that's pure profit. Why, why don't they want the money? Nobody answers Meryl Streep. <laughs> So uh, hit me in the next slide. Solution four, we will have more female directors when female win more awards. Uh, go ahead and hit me. You know whose picture it's going to be? It's Catherine Bigelow. <laughs> I hate to say it, but she's kind of the only one we got. <laughs> That's the, she is the first woman ever to win uh, the DGA director. Um, and the first woman ever to win an Academy Award. Um, only four other women have ever been nominated for Best Director for Academy Award. The year that she won for The Hurt Locker, um, directors were at 7%. 7% of women in Hollywood were directors. The year after she won, it went down to 5%. And I, like many women, thought, oh man, it's going to break down the doors, it's going to change things. I had somebody from the Indie Star call me 30 minutes after she won and said, what does this mean for you as a female filmmaker? People were excited. But then something happened. Um, I don't know, you might remember Brett Esten Elis. He tweeted about, uh, about right before Zero Dark Thirty came out. He's actually the screenwriter of American Psycho. He said, quote, Catherine Bigelow would be considered a mildly interesting filmmaker if she was a man. But since she's a very hot woman, she is overrated. This ignited a media fury. <laughs> the Huntington Post, Variety, Twitter, Ellen Barkin even retweeted, you're a shit writer. <laughs> I mean, it got really kind of ugly, you know, and it was just, you know, his opinion, one person, but it, it, it blew things out of the proportion. Uh, but then at the same time, he responded with, and I still believe The Hurt Locker, had it been directed by a man, would not have won an Oscar for Best Director. And the only time I felt a director deserved an Oscar was Sofia Coppola for Lost in Translation because it had no bullshit female tone. Anybody seen Hurt Locker? <laughs> There's one woman in the whole movie. I'm just saying, one. 
So, so anyway, so uh, but as, as sexist and as public as his rantings were, a great thing did happen. It inspired women to start talking about the situations that they have faced. And it brought more of these testimonials out that I've been like digging to find. They were like out in the open now, which was great. So one example, Martha Coolidge, uh, she directed your 80s awesome movies like uh, Real Genius and Valley Girl. Love her. Um, <laughs> she said the worst sexism she ever faced was when her agent sent in another woman for an interview. And afterwards, the guy called up and said, never send anybody in that I don't want to screw. He said something else, but. <laughs> um, Penelope Spears, who directed the $100 million grossing Wayne's World. Again, watch Wayne's World like many times, never knew it was directed by a woman. Um, she met an executive at Beverly Hills Hotel very early on in her career. And the guy was really drunk and started like ripping off her clothes. And she started screaming. He's like, do you want to direct this music video or not? It's for a music video. <laughs> Just say it. Um, there was also the story of a female president of a major studio who actually said, no woman over 40 could possibly have the stamina to direct a feature film. I've heard people say that the kind of films they want to make are too big and too tough for a female director. Uh, those are who honestly think that women can't handle the responsibility of large budgets should ask. Cheryl Sandbuck. <laughs> she is the CEO of Facebook and was on The Daily Show like a couple of days ago. I highly recommend watching. It was really awesome. Hit me the next one. Uh, this is in dry note. She runs PepsiCo. And then the next one. This is Virginia Rami. She runs IBM. And next one. This is Meg Whitman. She runs eBay. And she is now the CEO of Hewlett Packard. So the idea, <laughs> actually hit me one more. There you go. All right. So the idea, Sheryl Sandberg, okay, we'll just take her as an example because we all know and love and abuse Facebook, right? Facebook is worth $100 billion. Your average movie title here <laughs> is about $40 million. And they're honestly worried when Sheryl Sandberg can handle the decisions every day of a $100 billion enterprise that a female can't handle a $40 million movie. I think, I, I think that's a joke. <laughs> and something that they're not really putting into parameters. So, so that is the, uh, the big Hollywood problem. So let's talk about indies, because that's really what we're here and celebrating and all that kind of good stuff. So again, from the center of the study, go ahead and hit me with the next one. Uh, this is the, this, again, the center of the study of women in television. They also looked at film festivals. Film festivals are a lot harder to track and get data for because there's about 4,000 film festivals worldwide. Um, and so what this company, what this center did, is they took 23 film festivals from August of 2011 to 2012. They picked these, they were US was the first part. The second part, they were prestige and attendance. So that way they could get uh, the best data. So these are the film festivals that they got their information from. Um, okay, so let's see. So our percentage of women directors in Hollywood was 9%, right? All right, hand me the next one. They break it down by documentaries and narratives. We have 39% of women are directing documentaries and 18% of women are directing narratives in indie films. So that's a lot huger. <laughs> and these are the numbers that I'm seeing in my everyday life. So that's when I'm doing research and I see 5%, 9%. I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> I see a lot more female filmmakers that are actually making movies and getting their stuff out there. Now again, the reason why these numbers aren't translating to the box office numbers is because some videos don't see the light of day from film festivals. Some go direct on TV or onto demand or Netflix or what have you. So they don't always necessarily make it into the box office. So that's why there's one disparency sort of thing. So, um, so I made a, a side by side, so hit me the next one. The top one is the one we showed before of the box office. And then this one is our independence. And you'll see that in every category, whether you're looking at documentary or whether you're looking at narrative, there is a jump. Uh, the one that I'm actually most excited about, except for directors, is cinematographers. Because that, to me, 2% is cinematographers. That's, to me, a serious problem that should probably be talked more about than female directors. Uh, there's this documentary called, um, oh gosh, 
Shot by, is it shot by shot or side by side? I get it confused with the one that's showing here. The Keanu Reeves one, does anybody know what I'm talking about? All right, I'm gonna say it's shot by shot. <laughs> um, but Keanu Reeves did a documentary and it was, it was what it was, it was comparing digital film to film, to hard 35 millimeter, 70 millimeter. And the thing that I most enjoyed about that is of the first dozen cinematographers he talked to, four of them were women. And I'm like, wait a second, they exist. <laughs> What's going on here? So I, I, I thought that that was, that was amazing. There's a lot more than, than we know of. Um, but again, that's something that could be really talked about. So let's see. OK. So now 75% of the films that are released, hold on, go back. <laughs> No, you're good. Um, so remember, 75% of the films that are released are independent. Keep in mind, Catherine Bigelow is independent. She has never been funded by a big six studio. She makes all of her films independently financed, package them, and then sells them to a distributor. So you're in good company. That's what I'm saying. So we've proven so far that, uh, that female directors can bring in lots of profits. We've proved that uh, female directors are on the rise in independent film. And we've also kind of touched on the backlash of directing while female. But a lot of times these numbers can go like in one ear and out the other. So I'll give you my own experiences. So here you go. These, um, I've directed 13, film, 13 short films um, and one feature in the span of seven years. And I created uh, Karmic Courage Productions. The idea of Karmic Courage Productions is to have the courage to put good karma out into the world um, so it comes back. I like seeing good movies. And that doesn't mean particular genre. It just means movies that make me think, that make me feel good, that inspire me or challenge me or even you know, get me angry in a motivating way, that sort of thing. So I wanted to put movies out there so I would get more of those movies back. So. I've worked on over 50 projects, independently, freelance. I've worked for VH1 and MTV and Discovery Channel, and even films here in South Bend, which I love doing. The first time I came to this film festival, I got my first uh, screen super, or script supervisor job. And I was like, that's awesome! So it was great. It's working for Michael Whistler, Michael Whistler and uh, for Andrew. Gilbert, there we go. So, and I was like, oh, you guys believe in me. I was here with a silly little film. And they're like, help us, Kate. I'm like, OK. <laughs> I'm so excited. So now I come back and come back and get to work with more amazing people. Um, OK, so next slide. When I was 10, <laughs> look at that. I cut my own bangs, PS. Because <laughs> I was doing cartwheels. <laughs> Kept getting in my face. So, <laughs> OK, but when I was 10, um, I finally came out and said I wanted to be a director. Um, I was immediately told that I couldn't be a director, that it was for 40 and 50 year old men. When I was 16, I enrolled in an improv class because I wanted not to be an actor, but to experience what an actor goes through as a director so that way I could understand that nakedness on stage and that working you know, without a script and that sort of thing. Wanted to embed myself. My teacher told me at the end of that class that I should go into acting, because I might see some money in it, versus directing where I'd see no money in it. When I was 17, I was told by my drama teacher that I would never succeed in filmmaking. When I was 18, before I moved to Los Angeles, because obviously all these people in Michigan were wrong, <laughs> um, the main advice from my extended family is, you'll be back. That was their, their loving words. When I was 19, I went to, well, when I was 18 to 19, I went to UCLA. And I was actually told by my college professor that I wouldn't succeed in the Hollywood system because I was female. So I quit school. What the hell was the point? Uh, that followed a good five years of what I call the naysayers one. <laughs> it's like, all right, fine, you're all right, OK? I'll just live in Los Angeles and just work at a retail store and all that kind of good stuff. But when I was 25, hit me my next slide, my daughter was born. This is Cammie. She's actually out front. You can tell her how cute she was. <laughs> um, but she was born. And my father was there, and my father was holding her up. And he was just kind of talking to himself, sort of thing. And he said, I wonder what she'll be. And without even thinking, I said, she'll be whatever she wants to be in this world. And that was my wake up call. 
because how could I truly support whatever she wants to be in this world if I'm still thinking of the naysayers that stop me from doing mine? So I started to fight. I started to try to find that courage to be able to do what I've always wanted to do regardless of what other people say. To, if nothing else, prove to my daughter that it's worth it for her to fight for hers. So, go for the next one. When I was 29, I made my first for reals film <laughs> and it showed in front of an audience and an amazing thing happened. Nobody came, arrested me and put me in dream jail and the world didn't end. It was really quite amazing. Uh, people sat there and they, they watched a film that I made and that was something I didn't think I would actually get to. Um, I made little projects. I made projects for under 100 bucks. Um, I screwed up privately, <laughs> but I showed all my films publicly. I put myself out there and I put my work out there. Um, I was soon welcomed into the boys club of filmmaking in Indiana. And as my films got bigger and had more of a message, I started hearing the backlash. I started facing bullying. Uh, I faced bullying so hard I was actually in therapy for months. Um, I've been called a bitch. I've been called crazy. I've been kind of unstable. Um, a nurse made to a bunch of nuts. Um, when stressing a point of view, I'll sometimes work as an assistant director, and as most of you know, an assistant director keeps the time, makes sure that you are on schedule and under budget. That was my job. That's what they hired me to do. As I was stressing my point of the shot is taking too long, they asked me if I was on the rag or something. So these are the sort of things that I faced. Um, once my film started winning awards and showing nationally, it changed into who does she think she is. Um, I've even had filmmakers say they would be happy if I never made another film. So why on the world would I keep doing it? And this is why. Back to my kids. <laughs> That's the thing. Um, I'm here also because of my kids and I love film. Like all of you here, I absolutely adore it. They can transport you into another time, into another place. Um, I like to think of it is that I'm, some adventures I'm not brave enough to take that I can take in a movie. For two hours, I can take the punches with Rocky and not get a bruise. I can save New York City with a team of Avengers and never get hurt. Um, I can even get an idea of what it was like for Rosa Parks to sit on another seat in the bus. You know what I mean? So. I love also the, the craft of filmmaking, getting a team together, inspiring a passion and a vision that the audience can then go on. I do love the planning, the scheduling, the begging, <laughs> the begging for actors, for funding, for equipment. I love every part of it from fade in to telling the editor we have picture lock. I absolutely adore it. The two girls in my life, I've been asked a lot about the balance between motherhood and filmmaking. I don't see an obstacle. I've always seen them as the motivation. Um, that's just the way that I got the wake-up call and that I go into it. Um, my daughters can be anything they want in this world, and that's a lot to choose from. And it's not for me to choose, it's for me to just show them that it's worth it. Once you find that bliss, once you find that happiness, that people are gonna tell you no, because they've been told no. Because <laughs> obviously we've all been told no. But it's my job to say, hey, I push through it, let's push through it together. Because at least you know with me, I'm on your side, and I'm gonna help you get there. Um, my daughter sum it up best too. They say that daddy has a job, but mommy makes movies. <laughs> and that's one of my favorite things. Um, okay, so the next slide. There is the Gina Davis Institute on Gender and Media has this amazing slogan and this campaign that's called, if she can see it, she can be it. And this is very much what I've you know, been uh, teaching my daughter. So I very much love this Gina. It's brand new as well. I think it's only a year old. Um, so that now actually brings us to the biggest reason why we don't hear more from female directors, okay? That's why a lot of us who want to be a director aren't going after that dream and grabbing it. Okay, uh, next slide. There is an amazing book that I've been reading. It's called Delusions of Gender. And there's three different covers and I put them all up there because when I went to the library, they didn't have the yellow one. <laughs> so I'm like, wait, oh wait, do I have the right book? This book is amazing actually. Um, it's by Cornelia Fine and in it, 
there's hundreds of thousands of tests that they have done on the male and female brain, okay? And so far in my reading, <laughs> there has not been a single test that can prove any difference between the male brain and the female brain. They are exactly the same. Most of us have known this for a long time. However, uh, scientific proof. A lot of the proof that they did were math tests for some odd reason. They did a lot of math tests to prove uh, to gender and brain function and that sort of thing. And the only difference they started to see in male and female brains is when it came that stereotypes were introduced, okay? They would be handed a test and uh, a group of women would be handed a test and then they had a control group as well. One group was said, well, here's this test. Just want you to know that men usually do better on this test. It's probably because of genetics. And then the other group, they said nothing. They just handed the test. The group that heard the stereotype did worse on the test than the group that didn't hear anything. Um, and that's usually what it comes down to is women will try not to excel. They will just try not to screw up too badly because <laughs> they kind of know things are against them. Now, what they actually call it is performance anxiety. All right, and performance anxiety, it happens in men as well as, as, well as women. It's one of those things. Uh, but I want you to think of performance anxiety as this. All right, hand me this one. Okay. You are asked to read a book aloud in front of a group of people. All right. Now, you know this book. You've practiced this book. You know when you're going to you know, use hand gestures and when you're going to dance around the room. You know this. You're going to rock at this, right? Right before you step in front of a group of people, somebody hands you a new book. And they say, sorry, the rights weren't cleared with the first one. We're going to need you to read this one, OK? And then what they do is they ask you to wear sunglasses. Hit me the next slide. So <laughs> now, what do you do, all right? So the audience is waiting. I mean, they're already there. They've already been promised that somebody's going to read them something, right? So do you try the best you can and like excel at it? Or do you try just to get through it without screwing up too much because the odds are seriously against you and they know it, you know what I mean? So that is one way to think about performance anxiety, all right? Women face subconscious and conscious performance anxiety in the film industry because before they even step to that microphone, they know that few women succeed in filmmaking. They know that we can't, that we're told anyway, we can't handle large sums of money, uh, that we can't handle the pressure of a filmmaking schedule or handling hundreds of people. So that's the new book. That's the new book we're handed. The what? This, no, no, these aren't the words that I was gonna go with. The sunglasses is the negativity of us believing that might be true the stuff we're putting on ourselves. So the old saying, you can't drive a car and be the backseat driver at the same time. <laughs> that is the same thing for your brain. Hit me in the next one. The brain is an absolutely amazing thing. And the more I keep studying it, the more I'm just absolutely amazed by it. When your mind is clouded and shrouded in negativity, the synapses are not firing as actively as they are in a problem-solving brain. So you can't use your problem-solving brain at the same time you are actually fueled with anxiety. And the human brain, in men and women equally, is designed to be a problem-solver. That's why we've exceeded more than animals, <laughs> is because we are a problem-solver. So each new problem that you solve creates a new connection in the brain to solve problems faster, more efficiently, and more rapidly. What slows that down is negativity, fear, anxiety. Sounds like way too simple, doesn't it? <laughs> but I'll give you an example. Okay, um, on Ingenue, and I'm trying to remember if Mel was there this day, we were supposed to have like two police cars show up. All right, it's for an establishing shot. Um, and, but it was the 11th hour. It was becoming pretty obvious that these police cars were not going to show up, okay? So I could have gone into negativity, right? No one likes me and they think this movie isn't worth their time. That's what it sounds like in your head, by the way, okay? Um, or the fear, this whole movie is gonna go downhill, or the anxiety of the crew won't believe in me now. 
So instead, I had already pre-wired in my head for problem solving on film sets, was to ask myself every time, what does the story need? All right? So my whole thing was, can I solve, can I tell this story without police cars? Yes. So I cut the scene and we moved on. <laughs> it was something as simple as that, by just going to, all right, here's a problem. This is my wired connection of how to solve it. Done. You know, and even if it was, yes, we need them, all right, then we film another shot while somebody goes and gets freaking police cars. <laughs> you know, it's just that much more simple. Um, so we've got that negativity is the enemy of problem solving. And I'm sure, as you guys already know, uh, there's a crap ton of problem solving to be done on a film set, like every single minute. So, how does this relate to female filmmakers? Because we all have negativity, we all have you know, performance anxiety. Well, women have more negative triggers in their everyday life, okay? This is the rapid fire that I was talking about, so hand me the next one. An average American sees 247 advertisements every day. <laughs> it's a lot. We're talking billboards, we're talking magazines, we're talking television, we're talking internet. We see a lot of them. And actually probably with the internet we're, we might actually be seeing more now. But some of the things that we are seeing are remind us that our house isn't clean enough, that our skin isn't flawless, that we aren't sexy enough, that we don't have the right bra, because it's very important, <laughs> that our digestive tract isn't even healthy enough, that we don't love our kids enough, that we don't smell nice, <laughs> that we don't have the right shoes that make men fall in trails, <laughs> that we don't eat the right foods, that we don't cook the right meals, that we don't save enough money, that our hair isn't shiny enough, but most of all that we're fat <laughs> and we need to buy stuff to make ourselves pretty. Why? Hit me the next one. Because we're worth it. <laughs> That's right. Just saying. All right. We also have presidential candidates that are using his equality hiring by looking at women in binders full of women like it's a Playboy magazine. We also have, if we stand up for our liberal rights, for our reproductive rights, we are called sluts in any term you want to use, Rush Limbaugh being able to say it. We also criticize our female leaders about their hair. I'm just saying, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton unveils a new hairdo at UN meetings. How about she was trying to impart peace on Israel and Pakistan? <laughs> Whatever, it's okay. Um, and then lastly, we also deem celebrity by what new sex tape they have and what TV show that they can get. So next slide. What are we showing our young women? I don't care if they're in the film industry or not, uh, but what in the world are we showing them? Um, how are they going to overcome this negativity, whether it's conscious or subconscious or not, um, that's impeding them? Because they have the same potential as everybody else on this planet, their brain functions just the same, um, to succeed. So. It is only the thought and negativity of themselves that is holding them back. So this is where I come into what I think are possible solutions. My first solution is to the big six. I think if they really want to change the fact that there's only 9% of female directors in Hollywood working in the big six, and from my aspect of my research, I don't think they want to change it. I don't see them being active and even acknowledging that it's a problem. But if they do, I think they need to look at NASA. Hand me this next one. Yeah, there we go. NASA has a program called Women at NASA. And what they have is a website dedicated to past and present female leaders. They have profiles, they have interviews, they have a list of careers, forums, games, activities. They have an outreach program and everything. They're not just saying we want more women in NASA. They're going out to schools and encouraging math and science in young women. Uh, They're actually laying the groundwork to get more women into into NASA. And they're not just looking for astronomers, you know, they're looking for chemists and engineers and researchers. And you know, JPL is working on energy efficiency. So there's like a bound of things that they want people to work in. So 
This is an example of one of their um, things that they actually have for uh, one of their profiles that they do and also the uh, Girls and Boys Club that they do to get more people in. Um, already, NASA has actually doubled the female participation in NASA than what is in the film industry. And this women at NASA program has like just got it started. So, and then the next one, if the big six team together, um, wait, actually, yeah, if the big six actually team together, like NASA or like Save the Music, girls and boys could learn together to work as teamwork, as collaboration to create a visual medium that sets forth for an audience. Um, if Hollywood actively celebrated their female counterparts of the past and their innovations, then there would be a place at the table. I'll give you an example. Um, what if the big six combined and did a women at film? <laughs> they could actually showcase industry pioneers such as Alice Guy Blanche, she is the first person ever to make a narrative film. Not the first woman, the first person to ever make a narrative film. We've got Louise Weber. She was the first person to experiment with sound to prove that it could tell a story differently. Again, not the first woman, the first person. We also have Dorothy Arsnier, who is the first woman in the DGA, and she is credited with inventing the boom mic. So, and these are women up till 1945. Um, women at the turn of the century from 1900 of Alice Guy Blanche who was working with the Lumiere brothers um, to 1950, they were the innovators in the industry, they were the ones that were forwarding story, and then we forgot about them. So if they came back <laughs> and Hollywood embraced that idea, I think that we would actually start to see more innovations in the medium by women and by men because we're celebrating our innovations and what we can do forward. And I also feel that the, the magic of celebrating women of the past and of the future would actually probably be more powerful than any movie Hollywood could put out. That's just my theory. So. I think this is a step in the right direction because the first part of acknowledging any problem is acknowledging there's a problem. <laughs> so hand me my next one. So this is an example of the NASA Explorer School and Save the Music. They are very two very similar industries. And if you think of the Grammys, the Grammys is always talking about the Save the Music Foundation, right? We've got a little thing called the Academy Awards. <laughs> Just saying, if something like that they embrace the big six, uh, then there's a, there's a definite opportunity that we have there. All right, hand me my next one. All right, so for solutions for independent filmmakers. That was my solution for Hollywood for the big six. For independent filmmakers, I honestly keep doing what you're doing uh, because it's, it's improving. It's getting better. The quality of films that were out there, the film festivals that I'm going to see have a lot of films that are directed by women. But not only that, but it's getting closer and closer to a balance. And that's the thing. I don't personally want to see like every film directed by a woman. I just want to see a variety in stories, a variety in a point of view. Um, and I, I really appreciate that, especially in independent film festivals. So keep doing what you're doing. Keep making films. Get them into film festivals. Because obviously the Hollywood system is quite broken. Um, team together. Share your resources. There was a Sundance study that came out that women support women. Women are more encouraging of other women. They are more apt to tell you how they got funding, how they got distribution, to encourage each other that, hey, you know what, this sucks, but just fight another day. Send out to another film festival. I enjoyed your movies. You know, these sort of things is really um, a strong point. Also, create a new model of getting female-centered films out into the world. Um, because what we have now is not working. <laughs> um, and here's why that's actually important and totally doable. I swear it should be like a Pulitzer Prize or a Nobel Prize to whoever develops this. Because women are 51% of the population, right? Women are the main deciders on what tickets are bought when they go to the box office. Because it's, hey honey, what do you want to go see? They're also the main deciders on what their children see at the box office, okay? So you've got 51% of the population, more than 50% of women buying tickets. Only 16% of movies that are released are targeted towards women. Are you missing like a huge <laughs> aspect of the industry? Um, one example is Bridesmaids. Did anybody see Bridesmaids? Melissa okay. McCarthy. Okay, that movie. Um, uh, it was directed by the guy who did Knocked Up. 
And it was marketed as the 40-year-old virgin meets knocked up. And it was advertised on Spike TV. It was advertised during the football game. And it was advertised towards men. Because they thought, oh, this is you know, kind of like a cheese ball, gross comedy. Men are totally going to dig this. Well, what happened was women started coming. They started bringing their girlfriends. They started bringing their wives. They started bringing their aunts. Next thing you know, the box office is huge. And then they change their marketing strategy. And they start advertising it more towards women on shows that women watch. And it got bigger. And it got bigger. And as Hollywood usually gives up after week two, <laughs> screw it, the damage is done. <laughs> it kept growing and kept growing. So that's one example. I mean, my big fat Greek wedding from years ago was another example how women started talking to women about getting movies out there and they got bigger. So if you have a movie that doesn't insult a woman <laughs> and actually shows her something that's like really fun and excited about that maybe isn't Twilight, sorry. <laughs> cool. The lines for Twilight are incredible. Whenever they talk about women, the buying power of women, they always show an example of a line for Twilight. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so the other suggestion that I uh, recommend for indie filmmakers is to mentor. Mentor is really important. It's one of those things where I think we've gotten away from it. Uh, but by if you are a director or a costumer or an assistant director or any key position, it takes little energy to put a call out to say, hey, is there any high school you know, it's, it's going to sound weird. Any house school girls out there <laughs> who are interested in the film industry? I've actually been privileged um, this last little bit. I now have an intern that I work with. Her name is Dara, and she wants to be a costumer. And she's been shadowing me through this uh, post-production, not post-production, this distribution portion of Ingenue. And she's been learning much more than she ever would have in a classroom. And just seeing the, the daily struggles of what you go through and how to problem solve it. That is something that women and girls don't see in books. They see on set and they see how other people interact. They see the good, bad, and the ugly and they really grow from that and they'll have a head start that we didn't have because they'll have that experience. So mentor. I highly, highly recommend it and it's something that I'm really trying to do. Uh, next one. Okay, so solution for your average film fans, because I believe we are all film fans. <laughs> so I suggest to see more women female directors to see more films directed by women. Uh, look at film festivals. Look for them on your Netflix queue. Look for them at the box office. It doesn't mean I'm going to purposely try to find a film about a woman and go see it. Just be aware of you know, the things that you are seeing of, you know, that movie looks OK. Oh, wait, it's directed by a woman. Hold on. Wait. <laughs> Maybe I'll give it a chance. Because <laughs> some, you know, some of the film titles are you know, not be as familiar. I always do it where I, I try to support as many female chicas as I can. And if I see that it's directed by a woman, I will give it a much better shot of going and seeing it in the theater than waiting for it on Netflix and that sort of thing. So. Also, share those films that you enjoy with your friends and family, okay? Because a lot of them do not have a marketing push behind them. They do not have financial backing. They are hoping for someone to love their film as much as they love it and get it out there. Buy the DVDs. The reason why it's important to buy a DVD in this particular discussion of a female filmmaker, but also for independent filmmakers in general, is because when you buy a DVD, it is your vote. You are putting cash down and saying, this art has value, and I am paying for it. And that value goes to the filmmaker to say, somebody paid for my work. And then if enough people pay for the work, they get to do another one, and another one, and another one. So when you're buying a DVD from an independent filmmaker, you are investing in their future, and investing into their vision. And it might be something small like five bucks, it might be something like 10 bucks, it's totally worth it in the long run. That's all, it's like a pay it forward almost sort of thing. The last thing is learn the Bechtel test. Has anybody heard of the Bechtel test before? Yes, the Bechtel test, all right. The Bechtel test was developed by a cartoonist called, uh, named Alison Bechtel. And she overheard two women talking about film. And she developed this test. It only has three questions that you ask. And 
on her website, uh, thebechteltest.com, users actually chime in. They see a movie or a TV show, and they rank it, whether it's one out of three or three out of three, or questionable. There's a lot of arguments that happen on the Bechdel test. Oh, no, no, this totally happened. Yeah, it's really crazy. So it's very subjective, but it shouldn't be, because there's only three freaking questions. So hit me. Here's those three questions. Bechdel test. Are there two named women in the movie? Not mom, not secretary, not housemaid. Names, real names. The second is, do they talk to each other? <laughs> the third is, do they talk about something other than a man? <laughs> you would be surprised how many movies actually fail this test. And now, I don't know, we have a large number of women. Do you guys, you guys have names, right? And you guys like talk to each other? And it's not generally all about men. Oh, okay, so it happens in real life. Okay, I'm just, I'm double checking. Um, so yeah, but uh, I, I mean, I'll give you one example of the test. And this is one of those that is highly debated actually on the, on the website, which is actually quite fun. Zero Dark Thirty, all right? Zero Dark Thirty, yes, it has a very strong female protagonist in it, correct? She has a name, Maya. She has another woman that she works with, Jessica. Do they talk? Yes. What do they talk about? <laughs> Osama bin Laden. <laughs> or the other dude that's not giving them the, the, the missions that they want to do at work. So it's like, damn it. <laughs> Two out of three. So, so close. So yeah, but um, and actually five of the nine films that were nominated for Best Picture failed the Bechdel test. <laughs> I'm just saying. With something so easy, this is still happening. Now, I think it's an utterly simple formula. I think it is the absolute minimum <laughs> of what women would like to see in filmmaking, of we would like to be able to show our daughters that we exist. But get this. Uh, this happened this week, actually. There was an excellent article, and it was about a female screenwriter at UCLA. Um, and she was instructed on removing any aspect of passing the Bechdel test in her screenplays. And the reason, and this was even if it furthered the story, um, and the reason why was audiences don't watch women, and audiences don't want to listen to a bunch of women talking about whatever it is they talk about. That was the general consensus. And the word they was used a lot, by the way. <laughs> they don't want that. They don't accept that. I really like to meet these they people. Um, so I, I found this, and that article, by the way, is on Bechtel Test. If you go to BechtelTest.com, it says, new report, screenwriters are told not to pass the Bechtel Test. You can read that article and the, four, the articles that come after that. So I'm like, what the hell? So I posted this on my Facebook. Six minutes later, <laughs> I got a response from a male filmmaker who shall remain nameless, although if you're friends with me on Facebook, um, <laughs> that he, he said, I am not a big fan of the test because I'm adult to be cognizant of when to use a male character and a female character. He continued to post, forcing elements in your story that don't fit are dumb and won't serve any purpose. This is what got me thinking. Won't serve any purpose. I don't know if you've heard this statistic, all right? And we've been having fun, but I have a feeling I'm about to bring the room down. All right. <laughs> Once you hear the statistic, it is very hard to unhear it. Now, if you are a parent or if you have a daughter, one in five women report a sexual assault. That means far more of them are actually happening. I have two daughters. <laughs> so I've got myself, my daughter, and my other daughter. So already, I'm freaking terrified at this statistic because that is not freaking cool. Um, there was also a TED talk where Colin Stokes talks about movies and manhood. And when he talked about the statistic, he said, that's a lot of sexual assailants. So where are these sexual assailants learning this? Is one teeny tiny little part of that equation learning that women don't have names, that they don't talk to each other, and that they don't have friends? Is that one little part of it? Um, 
I also feel that I should, because of the one in five, because of the one in five, because the odds are stacked, um, I feel like I need to start preparing my girls when they get older that this is something that they will probably face or a friend of their will face and that terrifies me but I feel like I have some time until two days ago two days ago there was an article that came out two fifth graders conspired to rape and murder a classmate they are 10 and 11 right one of them brought a knife to school. The other brought a 45 caliber assault pistol. They had a handwritten seven step plan of what they had been plotting for two weeks. And when they talked to police, they knew exactly what rape was. Uh, they had actually, and they knew exactly what they were doing as well. Um, it wasn't one of those things where like, well, we're really not sure. Um, but they actually said that it was a display of strength and power and not sex. And they wanted this girl, why they wanted this girl raped and dead? It said, she was rude and makes friends, makes fun of my friends. So that is a wide brush that I'm painting with. Um, but if something as simple as this little test and awareness of the importance of the media that we're showing our young girls and the importance it is to have entertainment show them a piece of themselves that they can strive and achieve and overcome. So now I also go back to my problem solving brain because stuff like that is just too sad and too negative. So it's like, you know, my wiring is set back up to what am I going to do? Why do I do what I do? I go back to my daughters. I make films with strong and flawed female characters. I hope that one day, at least my daughters, because I always go with that, well, I'll make a film and at least my mom and dad will see it. You know what I mean? I still, <laughs> I still go back to that because it's a safety zone. I'm like, okay, all right, as long as mom and dad like it, maybe like two other people, it'll be totally fine. Um, but for them, if they see it later and they see an aspect of themselves or they see something that's like, yes, that's what mom was trying to teach me, but she was too busy yelling at me while she was doing it. I can see it in a movie. Um, but I feel like besides the movies that I can do a little bit more. So I'm actually creating a group called Women Empowering Balance, and it's called WEB. And it's a very small group. It's going to start very small. And it's about women coming together and just talking stuff out. Um, we're going to talk about the challenges we face, the, face, the challenges that our daughters face, and try to find a way to flip the script in our small communities. Just little things that we can do to make a difference. And the reason why it's called WEB, it's because each of us are interconnecting to make something bigger. So so that's the idea. So if you're interested in the group or anything like that, I will be here all day um, and all that kind of good stuff. And if you even want to start a sister chapter, which I have no idea what that would be, uh, <laughs> then we will do it. But I, I was really, really upset by the, the stuff that I was finding out this week. And I'm like, that's it. I'm doing something, damn it. <laughs> so now I'm sure there's going to be lots of questions, and I, I really would love to hear a discussion. The, uh, the great thing is, is that nobody has to be in this room till one, so. <laughs> but I mean, the things I didn't cover are techniques, you know what I mean? The nuts and bolts of directing while female, we can talk about that. We're talking about the industry as a whole. Um, whatever is on your brain for discussion. Um, I, I'm really one of those people that, that wants to talk about this and wants to solve this. So, um, so by all means, to turn our solutions into actions and stuff. Hit me the next slide. What do I have left? There's me. Ha -ha. And my kids. And the next one is, that's right, that's me. You can send hate mail here <laughs> and here. <laughs> it's already been done. Don't worry. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, it's okay. <laughs> We're still cool. <laughs> One, two, three, four. I want to tell you of a giant man. Does the best he can work 
drinking all day and half the night to do the thing. 